if you have nothing, you have to build it. And this is what Estonians did. They built it. Credit products are highly local. People might have brilliant credit history in own country, but on the moment they are moving to another country, they become nobody. Banks do not trust them anymore. We found a data solution which unlocks cross-border lending for people and banks, unifying data from different countries into one single hub, standardizing the data, analyzing the data, and presenting it to the banks over one single API. Tallinn is a beautiful old town, genuine fairy tale stuff. In fact, and this should not be held against it, it is what inspired me to start writing my first and always free on Amazon novel Draken. We explored it over a couple of sunny days and it is hard to think of somewhere more enchanting. Except perhaps Tallinn in the snow. I don't know, but I'm going to have to go back one winter to check it out. So if you've got an event... Uh, let's be honest, anywhere in the Baltics, I love Riga and Vilnius just as much. Let me know. Anyway, welcome to the 150th episode of How to Lend Money to Strangers with Brendan Lagrange in our 50th country visited. Kaido Saar, co-founder and CEO of Mifundo. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brendan. Kaido, Mifundo recently won Lentech of the Year in the Fintech Europe Awards. So I'm really excited to learn more about what you're doing. But you also spent nearly five years as CEO of an Estonian challenger bank at a time when I imagine that startup energy in the, in the fintech world that we really now associate with Estonia was starting to come to the fore. So would you mind spending a bit of time talking about what that Estonian financial services landscape looks like? And how have you seen it grow in your career, which, yeah, as I said, has come in a very interesting time for, for the country? In Estonia and the Baltics wider, I would say that it's highly concentrated the banking market. Banks have high share of a market and a limited number of banks who are dominating here. Probably it's also related to this small size yeah. of a country. Estonia is really small, just uh, 1.3 million uh, people living here. And entire politics together, it's a bit more than 6 million people living. It's still pretty small. Of course, there is a uh, vibrant fintech community in all the Baltic countries. Coming from Estonia, I could tell that Estonia is <laughs> is a is a best super etc. I still think that the Latvians, Lithuanians are doing very good in that field. But Estonians have been capable to build unicorns in fintech sphere. Number one, I believe everyone knows the Wise. This Estonian company, although they have a headquarters in London, but. Estonian founders started in Estonia and the majority of the team uh, is working every day. And first uh, highly successful Estonian technology company was Skype. That was definitely disruption all over the world to uh, communicate with your uh, cross-border uh, friends, relatives, and even no, with a video and for free. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to think now how big that was when it came. But as you said, like cross-border phone calls for free, those used to cost an absolute fortune. And so they may be reserved for special birthdays. And suddenly you could do it for free. But I always thought, and maybe I'm just uneducated, but I thought they were Swedish. Were the Swedish trying to claim credit or did I just remember it incorrectly? It was a combination of Swedish and Estonians. And of course, there was a role distribution. The Swedish guys, they were salesmen, Estonians built it. Growing up in South Africa, I don't know that I heard of Estonia until I was about 25 or 26 years old, in an MBA class where the Estonian model was being used as a, a case study on how a country can modernize and develop incredibly rapidly and broadly. And I guess that Estonia got independence and, and sort of jumped right into technology. But what is it that makes the Estonian people so good at embracing, I guess, innovation and, and, and innovating, well, in fintech, but uh, across industries? At first, in 1990s, after uh, getting independence back from uh, Soviet Union, people didn't have anything. 
if you have nothing, you have to build it. Yeah. And this is what Estonians did. They built it. Estonians naturally have a passion regarding technology. Also, maybe the people in Estonia is more like uh, individualistic. They would like to uh, work alone. And by the way, during COVID uh, time, each country set regulations. You need to keep a distance. In some countries, one and a half meters. We had two meters. And the moment the restriction was removed, everybody was happy. Finally, we can return back to five meters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a joke, of course, but for example, comparing northern people versus southern people in Europe. In South, everyone is socializing quite a lot uh, at work. After our work, uh, going to the bar, a uh, small drink and socializing. But Estonians, and probably the same in Nordics in general, are more like, uh, yeah, how to say, introverts. And this actually supports building a technology and building the digital solutions, what you can use and consume uh, over internet. Let's go back to banking. You built a career at Big Bank capstoned uh, with a sort of four and a half, five years as CEO. And when you left Big Bank, you took on some interesting uh, projects. So normally when I talk about these sorts of other things that someone's done, that one of my guests has done, I leave it to the end as kind of a lighter moment. But reading your, your LinkedIn, I'm too intrigued to, to put it last. So talk to me about making sustainable products from reeds. Where did that come from and, and how's that going? How come a bank CEO becomes a startup? Never happens. But honestly, all the 15 years working in this bank, that was a startup. I was early employee in this company. It wasn't a bank on that moment. Just 30 persons working there. And I came directly from the university as a student. Due to this, I was one of the persons who built up the bank, which finally operates in nine different countries in European Union. And of course, ended up being a chairman of the management board of his bank. So for me, it was a startup later on scale up and then right now doing new startup. And uh, between two financial industry startups, you are right. Uh, there was uh, the Sutto, which is producing sustainable items based on reed plants and I uh, invented a eco-friendly material. And why? Of course, I had the interest regarding environmental part and uh, nature. But the uh, second thing that uh, after I left from Big Bank, I had the obligation to stay away from financial sector for a while. And uh, if uh, you have a lot of time, then you can work with your hobbies and interests. And this is what I did. And I'm extremely happy that it wasn't just a sh short term uh, hobby for me, but this company is really up and running and uh, developing on. Well, I think there's a couple of wonderful stories in there from starting at the bottom and working your way up to the top of Big Bank. There's a good message in there, but also in yeah, pursuing these hobbies, you know, the world has changed to where more of us are doing fractional work and side projects and spinning them off. And it's great to see yeah, the pursuit of something like that rather than just literally gardening on your in your gardening leaf. So uh, wonderful stuff. And for anybody interested in you and your story, you can obviously go and explore those. But yeah, let's uh, talk about Mifundo. As I said, it's already you know, winning awards. I saw your team on uh, at Money 2020. You've been on stages at uh, accelerators and conferences and such. Mifundo is a, a data solution which enables cross-border lending for people and banks in Europe. But if we start right at the beginning, at the, at the most basic level, what, what does that mean? What is Mifundo? What are you bringing to market? Mifundo is a data solution which unlocks cross-border lending for people and banks. And the problem, what we are solving is uh, credit products are highly local right now. And the specific problem is that people might have brilliant credit history in their own country, but on the moment they are moving to another country, they become nobody. Banks do not trust them anymore. Also, as we have uh, worked in banking, built up the lending operations in nine countries in Europe, no, we know which are a challenge on bank side. And it's just high risk for the banks to credit foreigners because they don't have uh, access to the data to get a holistic uh, overview of the background of these people and credit worthiness of these people. Even if the bank would have access for the data, 
Next question is how to interpret data, how to understand, uh, how to read it. Uh, these are the challenges we are working with. And uh, our focus is actually uh, Europe, more specifically European Union. So a lot of people were surprised, like in the US, I'm talking with some persons where they are surprised. Wow, is it really true that you cannot move from one country to another and bring your credit history with you? Not like in the US, it's normal that uh, you might live in West Coast, you relocate to East Coast, no issues. Because there is one single mechanism uh, to collect the data and one single uh, scoring system. Of course, there are competing ones, but all of them, they are uh, nationwide. Yeah. But in Europe, it's surprising how come that 27 countries and 27 different mechanisms, how to collect the data, how to analyze the data, and there is no data exchange between these countries. So it's surprising, and I think it's surprising for uh, European people for themselves. This is a true problem. I have never thought about it, but it's, it, it's reality. You sort of think about the EU and, and what it's done and how much freedom of movement it, it provides. And I think before Brexit ruined it all for us British people, you know, I moved to Denmark about 15 years ago now. And on the basis of just having the pink passport, I'd never even lived in the UK. I came from South Africa, but I had a British passport. I could land in Copenhagen, rent a house, get covered by medical and all those things that come with being a European citizen and not move a little bit of data on a file. As I say, it's one of those things that sounds like somebody should have done it 20, 30, 40 years ago. Nobody has. And then as soon as you start thinking about it a bit more carefully, you realize, okay, it probably is more complicated maybe than we think at first. So what does it really mean to enable cross-border lending in Europe today? What, what pieces do you need to put together to make this puzzle work? We are uh, unifying data from different countries into one single hub. We are standardizing the data, analyzing the data, and presenting it to the banks over one single API. So for a bank, it doesn't matter if the customer is coming from Poland, Germany, Spain, Italy. Typically, banks have a share of foreign customers, uh, 10 to 15%. Okay, 10 to 15% is good enough to care about. Yeah. But the problem is that with 10 to 15%, they are not coming from one single country. <laughs> and they are coming from 27 or even more countries also outside of EU, like the UK, Switzerland, etc. So quite a long list of the countries. This is a problem. Uh, and it's not feasible for one single bank to build the data pipelines and try to build the knowledge and standardize. No, it's just too expensive. But in our case, it is okay because if we are building this infrastructure, we can sell it to different banks and each bank is paying their share. But of course, there are plenty of hurdles, not only technology hurdle, uh, there is legal hurdles. Also, we have European Union, one same same legal framework. But as it said, devil is in the details. So in different uh, countries, it's still a bit different and we are solving these hurdles. Yeah. And as you said, like 10, 15% is, is significant, but I think it's even doubly so because when I moved to Denmark, the first week we went to Ikea and bought an entire house worth of furniture. You know, when I moved to England, we had to get a car. We were looking for a house, so we needed a mortgage, needed to open a phone contract. You've got this concentrated time period when you're new in country where you're trying to gather everything that maybe you bought and sold when you left your home country. You had 20 years to, to slowly accumulate. Your credit needs are often quite significant quite early on. So that old approach of saying, well, live in the country for six months or 12 months or 18 months, and then I'll consider you. Even if you get credit then from the local bank, it's too late. You've already found a way to stock your house and you've got a couch and a television and everything you wanted. So, you know, they, they've got even more upside than, than pure numbers would suggest. Our chief product officer, she's a student citizen, but she lived in Spain for 15 years. And uh, on the moment uh, she decided to return to Estonia, of course, she wanted to buy a living place, uh, asked a housing loan from the banks, but no any bank in Estonia granted a housing loan. They told that your credit history in Spain and come back after two years. But she needed a living place that moment, not after two years. And uh, this is a real, uh, real issue in Europe. But besides relocating 
we see that in Europe there are a lot of people which are moving uh, back and forth, no, daily commuting between uh, two countries because there are very nearby cities, but there is a country border between two cities. Uh, so many samples in Europe, it's small and uh, a lot of different populations are living uh, nearby and, and uh, waiver credit availability might be also harmed because your credit history is split it not sometimes and uh, also you should rather win from this but uh, asking competing offers from uh, banks in both countries but reality might be vice versa that none of them is financing you yeah so second target group and third one what is co- quite common uh, in europe we have seen people which don't want to relocate but they want to buy a real estate property in another country. So again, how the bank knows that uh, you are a good customer if there is no data. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's so many of these real world situations that evolve. Yeah, my sister-in-law worked in Luxembourg for a while and she said, you know, when when it hit the end of the day, basically Luxembourg was was just her alone in her hotel room and all the workers had gone across the border back to their own homes because uh, of the cost of living and yeah i used to work at uh, the company headquartered in monaco and it's very similar where everyone just goes home to nice at the end of the day and one uh, interesting measure we are using is back reporting to our credit bureaus quite often no? of course banks are worried that let's say that i'm providing credit to foreigner but what happens if a foreign person returns back to home country after a while who who pays the credit so uh, what's the solution in our uh, technology is back reporting. So uh, back re- reporting to a credit bureau in the home country. So even if a person decided to return to home country, then the information is also there. And uh, if person decides not to pay the credit, then of course negative information is visible and uh, the person cannot get the new credit pro- product from the local banks in home country. So it's a kind of insurance. Yeah, it's a very clever closing of that loop. I guess that's the difference between saying we're here for immigrants who have arrived in country to live the rest of their lives here and they've severed the ties to their home country versus your approach, which says this is for people that are living in another country and they may be going back. And of course, even if they go to a third country, that means you've got the complete profile. So uh, yeah, an interesting twist on that, but a really important one uh, I hadn't thought of myself. If I'm a a new arrival in country, do I drive the process by going to Mifundo or have you set that up with the bank and when I go to the bank, uh, I'll see an option? How do you balance those two sides of the equation? Both options are uh, possible. Just quite often, consumers do not know which bank is suitable for foreign uh, people. So if you know, if you have good bank, then I'm sure bank can initiate the inquiry through a Mifunda. But if you don't know which bank is a pr- proper one, then it's wise to approach directly. Yeah, and I pick up a little bit on there on, on, on your bedding down in Europe plans because I was on mefundo.com last night just sort of looking around and, and I noticed that you know, one of the things you do is allow your customers or your, your users to choose where you go next or where you focus on, on, on integrating next. So, But what is your thinking in terms of how you spread across Europe? Yeah, right now we are uh, focusing uh, to Europe and European Union, so we don't solve all the problems. I believe if banks accept foreigner from another EU country at first, after that we can talk about the persons outside of uh, EU step by step uh, to convince the banks, of course, they need to get the feeling that, yes, I can issue a credit uh, to foreigners. So it's purely a trust and uh, risk issue. Breaking down that first wall to say, hey, this data can move countries and is still applicable when it's uh, in a new home. Kaido, I first saw you and met your team at Money 2020 in Amsterdam last year. I know you're traveling around almost as much as that data of yours, but if anyone listening now would like to learn more about Mifundo, maybe would even like to try and catch you at an event or pitch that you're doing. Where can they go online to learn more and to stay on top of the work you're doing? 
there is serious interest regarding the funda, I think the best is just to go to our LinkedIn uh, page or our web page and uh, contact us. <laughs> it's the best and the fastest option. But uh, if you're asking about uh, events, then uh, also this year, we are participating in Money 2020 in Amsterdam in June. We gonna have our own stand as a part of Estonian uh, national stand. Estonian country has selected uh, some of best and most interesting uh, fintech companies, and we are one of them. Uh, and we are happy to talk with anyone who is interested in Bifunda. Yeah, so I, I'll hopefully be there again this year. I say that that whole stand was full of interesting companies last year. I'm sure it will be again. So I'll look out for you and, and anyone listening should do the same. And Kaido, thank you for making the time. It's been really interesting and exciting to hear what you are bringing to the market. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you all for listening. Please do look for and follow the show on your favorite podcast platform and share the updates widely on LinkedIn. Plus, send me a connection request while you're there. This show is written and recorded by myself, Brendan LaGrange, in Brighton, England. Show music is by I Am Wake, and you can find show notes and written transcripts at www.howtolendmoneytostrangers.show. And I'll see you again next Thursday.